Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on the life of Frederick Douglass, who wrote three autobiographies. I will continue with the second autobiography written by Frederick Douglass, which is My Bondage and My Freedom, which each week I will read to you certain portions of each chapter. The e-book can be downloaded from www.guttenberg.org backslash files backslash 202 backslash 202 dash h backslash 202 dash h dot htm. The Nature of Slavery, extract from a lecture on slavery at Rochester, December the 1st, 1850. More than 20 years of my life were consumed in a state of slavery. My childhood was environed by the baneful peculiarities of the slave system. I grew up to manhood in the presence of this hydra-headed monster, not as a master, not as an idle spectator, not as a guest of the slaveholder, but as a slave, eating the bread and drinking the cup of slavery with the most degraded of my brother, bondmen, and sharing with them all the painful conditions of their wretched lot. In consideration of these facts, I feel that I have a right to speak, and to speak strongly, yet my friends I feel bound to speak truly. Goading, as have been the cruelties to which I have been subjected, bitter, as have been the trials through which I have passed, exasperating as have been, and still are, the indignities offered to my manhood, I find in them no excuse for the slightest departure from truth in dealing with any branch of the subject. First of all, I will state, as well as I can, the legal and social relation of master and slave. A master is one, to speak in the vocabulary of the southern states, who claims and exercises a right of property in the person of a fellow man. This he does with the force of the law and the sanction of southern religion. The law gives the master absolute power over the slave. He may work him, flog him, hire him out, sell him, and, in certain contingencies, kill him with perfect impunity. The slave is a human being divest divested of all rights, reduced to the level of a brute, a mere chattel in the eye of the law, placed beyond the circle of human brotherhood, cut off from his kind, his name, which the recording angel may have enrolled in heaven among the blessed, is impiously inserted in a master's ledger with horses, sheep, and swine. In law, the slave has no wife, no children, no country, and no home. He can own nothing possess nothing, acquire nothing, but what must belong to another, to eat the fruit of his own toil, to clothe his person with the work of his own hands, is considered stealing. He told that another may reap the fruit, he is industrious that another may live in idleness, he eats unbolted meal that another may eat the bread of fine flour, he labours in chains at home, under a burning sun and biting lash, that another may ride in ease and splendor abroad. He lives in ignorance that another may be educated. He is abused that another may be exalted. He rests his toil-worn limbs on the cold, damp ground that another may repose on the softest pillar. He is clad in coarse and tattered raiment that another may be arrayed in purple and fine linen. He is sheltered only by the wretched hovel that a master may dwell in a magnificent mansion and to this condition he is bound down as by an arm of iron. From this monstrous relation there springs an unceasing stream of most revolting cruelties. The very accompaniments of the slave system stamp it as the offspring of hell itself. To ensure good behavior, the slaveholder relies on the whip to induce proper humility. He relies on the whip to rebuke what he is pleased to term insolence. He relies on the whip to supply the places of wages as an incentive to toll. He relies on the whip to bind down the spirit of the slave, to imbrute and destroy his manhood. 
He relies on the whip, the chain, the gag, the thumb screw, the pillory, the bowing knife, the pistol, and the bloodhound. These are the necessary and unvarying accompaniments of the system. Whether, wherever slavery is found, these horrid instruments are also found. Whether on the coast of Africa, among the savage tribes, or in South Carolina, among the refined and civilized, slavery is the same, and its accompaniments are one and the same. It makes no difference whether the slaveholder worships the God of the Christians, or is a follower of Muhammad. He is the minister of the same cruelty and the author of the same misery. Slavery is always slavery, always the same foul, haggard, and damning scourge, whether found in the eastern or in the western hemisphere. There is a still deeper shade to be given to this picture. The physical cruelties are indeed sufficiently harassing and revolting, but they are as a few grains of sand on the seashore, or a few drops of water in the great ocean, compared with the stupendous wrongs which it inflicts upon the mental, moral, and religious nature of its hapless victims. It is only when we contemplate the slave as a moral and intellectual being that we can adequately comprehend the unparalleled enormity of slavery and the intense criminality of the slaveholder. I have said that the slave was a man. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculties! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. The slave is a man, the image of God, but a little lower than the angels, possessing a soul, eternal and in destructible, capable of endless happiness or immeasurable woe, a creature of hopes and fears, of affections and passions, of joys and sorrows, and he is endowed with those mysterious powers by which man soars above the things of time and sense and grasps with undying tenacity, the elevating and sublimely glorious, glorious idea of, of a god. It is such a being that is smitten and blasted. The first work of slavery is to mar and deface those characteristics of its victims which distinguish men from things and persons from property. Its first aim is to destroy all sense of high moral and religious responsibility. It reduces man to a mere machine. It cuts him off from his maker. It hides from him the laws of God and leaves him to grope his way from time to eternity in the dark under the arbitrary and despotic control of a frail, deprived, and sinful fellow man. As the serpent charm of India is compelled to extract the deadly teeth of his venomous prey before he is able to handle him with impunity, so the slaveholder must strike down the conscience of the slave before he can obtain the entire mastery of his victim. It is then the first business of the enslaver of men to blunt deaden and destroy the central principle of human responsibility. Conscience is, to the individual soul and to society, what the law of gravitation is to the universe. It holds society together. It is the basis of all trust and confidence. It is the pillar of all moral rectitude. Without it, suspicion would take the place of trust. Vice would be more than a match for virtue. Men would prey upon each other like the wild beasts of the desert and earth would become a hell. Nor is slavery more adverse to the conscience than it is to the mind. This is shown by the fact that in every state of the American Union where slavery exists, except the state of Kentucky, there are laws absolutely prohibitory of education among the slaves. The crime of teaching a slave to read is punishable with severe fines and imprisonment and in some instances with death itself. Nor are the laws respecting this matter a dead letter. Cases may occur in which they are disregarded, and a few instances may be found where slaves may have learned to read, but such are isolated cases and only prove the rule. The great mass of slaveholders look upon education among the slaves as utterly subver subversive of the slave system. I well remember when my mistress first announced to my master that she had discovered that I could read. His face colored at once with surprise and chagrin. He said that 
I was ruined, and my value as a slave destroyed, that a slave should know nothing but to obey his master, that to give a negro an inch would lead him to take an L, that having learned how to read, I would soon want to know how to write, and that by and by I would be running away. I think my audience will bear witness to the correctness of this philosophy and to the literal fulfillment of this prophecy. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals hello listeners if you're enjoying the new heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization please visit www.newheightseducation.org and while you're there check out our online store Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Frederick Douglass will continue. What to the Slaves is the 4th of July? Extract from an oration at Rochester, July the 5th, 1852. Fellow citizens, pardon me, and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light, and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Why so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude? that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the alleluias of a, na- of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man in a case like that. The dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as in heart. But such is not the state of the case, I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems where where inhumane mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me? by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes towering up to heaven were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, bearing that nation in irrecoverable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of a peeled and woe-smitten people. By the rivers of Babylon, There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. 
For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the moanful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilant shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, to forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with a popular theme, would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject, then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous, hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man, whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or who is not at heart a slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. The Internal Slave Trade Extract from a, an oration at Rochester, July the 5th, 1852. Take the American slave trade, which we are told by the papers is especially prosperous just now. Ex-Senator Benton tells us that the price of men were never higher than now. He mentions the fact to show that slavery is in no danger. This trade is one of the peculiarities of American institutions. It is carried on in all the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy, and millions are pocketed every year by dealers in this hard traffic. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called, in, contra in contradistinction to the foreign slave trade, the internal slave trade. It is probably called so, to in order to divert from it the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. The trade has long since been denounced by this government as pir piracy. It has been denounced with burning words from the high places of the nation as an execrable traffic. To arrest it, to put an end to it, this nation needs a squadron, an immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhumane traffic, opposed, like, opposed alike to the laws of God and of men. The duty to extirpate and destroy it is admitted even by our doctors of divinity. In order to put an end to it, some of these last have consented that their colored brethren, nominally free, shall leave this country and establish themselves on the western coast of Africa. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade. The American slave trade sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know 
What is a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of these human flesh droppers armed with pistol, whip, and bow and knife drive in a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the common field and the dead, deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhumane wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood-chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There, see the old man with locks thin and grey. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her brinny tears falling on the brow of the ba babe in her arms. She, too, that girl of thirteen, weeping, yes, weeping as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. The drove moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly you hear a quick snap. Like the discharge of a rifle, the fetters clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the centre of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child in her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow this drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever, and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from the scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glance at the American slave trade, as it exists at this moment in the ruling part of the United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. When a child, my soul was often pierced with a sense of its horrors. I lived on Philpot Street, Fel Fells Point, Baltimore, and have watched from the wharves the slave ships in the basin anchored from the shore with the cargoes of human flesh waiting for favorable winds to waft them down the Chesapeake. There was at that time a grain there was at that time a grand slave mart kept at the head of Pratt Street by Austin Waldfork. His agents were sent into every town and county in Maryland, announcing their arrival through the papers and on flaming handbills headed Cash for Negroes. These men were generally well dressed and very captivating in their manners, ever ready to drink, to treat, and to gamble. The fate of many a slave had depended upon the turn of a single card and many a child has been snatched from the arms of his mothers by bargains arranged in a state of brutal drunkenness. The fleshmongers gather up their victims by dozens and drive them, chained to the general de de deport at Baltimore. When a sufficient number have been collected here, a ship is chartered for the purpose of conveying the forlorn crew to Mo Mobile or to New Orleans. From the slave prison to the ship, they are usually driven in the darkness of night for since the anti-slavery agitation, a certain caution is observed. In the deep, still darkness of night, I have been aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chained gangs that passed our door. The anguish of my boyish heart was intense, and I was often consoled when speaking to my mistress in the morning to hear her say that the custom was very wicked, that she hated to hear the rattle of the chains and the heart-rending cries. I was glad to find one who sympathized with me in my horror. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is today in active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the south. I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. 
Is this the land of your father's love? The freedom which they told to win? Is this the earth whereon they moved? Are these the graves they slumber in? But a still more inhumane, disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. By that act, Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is co-extensive with the star-spangled banner and American Christianity. Where these go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred, he is a bird for the sportsman gun. By that, mouse, by that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad republican domain is a hunting ground for men, not for thieves and robbers, enemies of society, merely, but for men guilty of no crime. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state, your lords, nobles, and the ecclesiastics enforce as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have within the past two years been hunted down and without a moment's warning hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children depend upon them for bread, but of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men there are neither law, justice, humanity, nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets ten dollars for every victim he consigns to slavery, and five when he fails to do so. The oath of uh, two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless, remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world, that, in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic, Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their office under an open and pal palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join... Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please follow us on your favorite network. We are asking that you support NHEG by giving to a great cause that fights for equal rights for all, for all students. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.